If you're wondering how or perhaps even whether to install a gravel path, but you're wor worried about maintenance, you're worried about gravel migrating, that sort of thing, then today's video is for you because I'm going to show you just how easy it is to lay a gravel path like this. But also I want to point out to you how solid these paths are, even for bike or wheelchair access, even when laid on a slope like this. And that's because of one magic ingredient, a gravel reinforcing mesh grid. And this isn't a one-off flash in the pan review today because I installed one of these paths a year ago and this one most recently last week. So I'll be casting an eye back on that path I installed a year ago to explain to you what I've learnt and what, if anything, I do differently this time round. So let's have a quick look at today's toolkit. We've got the brilliant Ansel High Flex Professional Work Gloves, which put quite simply, I couldn't manage without these days. We've got weed matting, Type 1 MOT aggregate, sharp or coarse sand, although a bit of a confession on that shortly, my Roughneck 10 inch soil tamper, a spade, a saw or grinder, wheelbarrow, need a gravel 129, which is a 29 millimeter gravel mesh grid, and I'm not being paid anything to mention them in today's video, and finally 10 millimeter gravel. Preparation is key to installing a decent path that will last. Typically you're going to want to excavate the area below the path so that you can lay a sub-base. I say typically because if you've got an existing surface like tarmac or concrete that has decent drainage, is below the house, damp proof course, and the perimeter edges don't need adjusting, you can do away with laying any new foundations and save yourself a heap of money. And in fact on this path a lot of it was excavated but other parts of it were laid on the course of the old path which we didn't bother to excavate. Apart from removing a few high spots as you can see me doing here. Now working out how much you need to excavate depends on the sort of path you're laying and I've prepared this summary table to make it easy for you to work it out. There are typically three grid sizes depending on whether you're going for light traffic like me or heavier traffic like cars. I'm going to be using the lightest weight 29 millimeter deep grid and you can see from the path I built a year ago now partly ripped up sadly because of the current building works how you assemble the layers below the grid. So as you can see here you've got the weed matting, you've got the primary aggregate layer which in this case is about 50 to 60 mil deep, and then you've got the sharp sand blinding layer and finally the reinforced mesh grid and then on top of that once it's better down 10 to 15 mil of gravel. So for a path like mine you'd be looking to excavate around about 109 millimeters and as you can see with last year's path when you're digging down this deep it's a good idea to install some sort of edging to retain and separate the surrounding ground from the path. Last year I used these 100 millimeter gravel boards which I anchored in position to post protect with bitumastic paint and set in postcrete, a fast setting concrete which is perfect for this sort of job. And there are lots of other options as you can see here but this time round my job was made a lot easier because the builders had already constructed this brick edging which flanks the path obviously on both sides. However what I did need to do was repair the broken threshold strip of bricks up at the top of the path and to do this I excavated to the course below the course that had been pulverized by the diggers on this current building job. And an 18 volt SDS drill in chisel mode is a fantastic tool to use for this. And then made up a mix of builder's sand and cement about five to one with some sharp sand mixed in and cut some spare bricks to repair the threshold using this grinder mate cutting jig that Metex recently gifted me to try out. I then set these in the sand and cement which was a little soft at this point because I added plasticizer you've got to be really careful when you do that that you don't add too much water to the mix but as it happens it didn't matter and it did actually enable me to place the bricks in position on the bed of sand and cement pretty easily and then point in those new bricks ready for the sub base layer. On the garden build the boys let the mortar go off before raking with a wire brush but to match the old pointing I used one of my favourite tools, this small tool and a pointing trowel. As you can see here you start with the weed matting. Now this is to stop weeds getting through obviously but it also separates the subgrade which might be soil from the sub base material preventing the soil or whatever it is mixing in with that sub base. Although a bit of a confession here when we laid the sub base for this path I have to say I didn't ask my builders to put in a weed matting layer. Now at particularly at this end of the path we've got I reckon something around about 250 to 300 mil of sub base and then at the top of the path as I mentioned earlier we're pretty much laying the grid material on top of the existing path so we didn't bother with the weed matting. Time will tell whether this is an issue but I suspect it won't be. There is also a geotextile membrane underneath the gravel grid mesh itself which I'll come on to in a minute. 
For a perfect sub base, you want about 50 to 100 mil of primary aggregate. Type 1 MOT being perfect for this, which is basically a crushed limestone and grit mixture containing stones from 40 millimeters down to dust, which mix makes it ideal for compacting. I've been ordering tons and tons of this stuff for this current garden and house renovation. And what I'm using these days is actually recycled Type 1 MOT because it's cheaper than the normal stuff. Now with the path I laid a year ago, you can see how I laid and then uh, whacked down or tamped down the Type 1 MOT. But this time round, I was fortunate that the builders had already laid the Type 1 MOT in place. So all that remained for me to do this time round was to get my 10 inch saw tamper that I bought from Screwfix and basically even out the uneven layers of the Type 1 with that tamper. You're doing this to iron out all the noticeable low and high spots. And I also used an old ceiling raft to cut to the width of the path to give me a sort of good idea as I moved up the path where those high and low spots were. You could of course use a whacker plate if you've got large areas to do, as you can see I did last time round. But to be honest with you, for a path this size, it really wasn't necessary and the whole process probably took me about three quarters of an hour. You'd be tempted to say this tamping is a bit of a waste of time, but you can see from this time lapse actually just how much of a difference it makes to the surface of that sub-base layer. With the sub-base complete, it's considered to be good practice to lay a 10 to 15 millimeter bedding or blinding layer of sharp sand. What this does is smooth out the surface by filling any voids in the sub-base between the large stones and the dust. And it also helps you to achieve the final levels that you're after. Now, I've got to be honest, I had a big one ton pile of builder's sand sat on the drive and I didn't actually have any sharp or grit sand lying about, unlike a year ago where you can plainly see that I was using this. So this time round, I decided to use that builder's sand instead. And while sharp sand is obviously more suitable for a job like this, the builder's sand did a great job. And you can see here how I tamped it down flat in preparation for those gravel mesh grids. Now, after all that hard work, we're on to the easy bit of installing the gravel stabilization grids. I've chosen Nida Gravel 129, which is a small format grid for garden, paths, patios, seating areas, and small driveways. And as you can see here, incredibly light. The grids are a polypropylene structure with a porous geotextile membrane bonded to the underside to prevent the grid raising up through the stones. And the membrane overlaps all the way around so you can butt up each sheet whilst maintaining the continuity of the membrane. You simply lay the grids onto the blinding layer. It's best practice to stagger the sheets where you're laying over a large area, but as you can see with a narrow path like mine, it makes sense just to lay them widthways with a full sheet bearing the weight of the most frequent traffic. Now dead easy to cut. You can use an angle grinder or reciprocating saw, but I find it easiest to use my Owen Jack floorboard saw with its tiny teeth quickly and neatly cutting through the grids. You can see how I infill this tricky corner section and I then place the offcuts in the gaps at the edge, which are unlikely to get heavy if any footfall. And you can walk on the mesh once laid as you can see me doing here, but I don't recommend a heavily laden wheelbarrow as when you tip the barrow, it can damage the honeycomb structure. And now for the final step, possibly the most satisfying thing you'll ever do in DIY. Now the gravel you use in your grids is down to personal choice, particularly the colour, but you just need to make sure that the gravel you choose is appropriate for the grid that you've laid. In my case, four to 10 millimetres for the Nida Gravel 129. Any larger than that and it won't settle properly in the honeycomb structure. Also, it should be angular gravel that compacts and interlocks well and therefore maximises the stability of the path. In my case, I had a one ton bag of golden gravel left over from the path I laid last year. This was expensive at the time. It's currently 112 pounds, including VAT for a one ton sack. It wasn't enough to do the whole path and DIY wife didn't want it to look too golden. So I mixed it with a much cheaper standard 10 millimeter gravel that you see here, which is 50 pounds, including VAT for a one ton sack to achieve this color that we've ended up with. If you don't want to mix it, you can still save money by filling the majority of the grid with the cheap stuff, like I did with my old path a year ago, and then simply scatter the pure, more expensive gravel on top. When I laid the last path, I used a piece of feather edge board to smooth it out, but after starting with the same tool this time around, I find it much easier to use an old broom, and you want to lay the gravel so there's about 20 to 25 millimeters of gravel above the mesh, as over the next two to four week period, it may compact down with traffic, leaving you ideally with about 10 to 15 millimeters above the mesh. This is the perfect thickness. Any less and the grid may show through or it'll just feel a little hard to walk on. Any more than that and you'll find your feet squidging into it more like a typical path. 
I've had to rip up half of my original path as part of the renovation works on our kitchen and garden, but what's left is looking exactly as it did when I laid it. And call me sad for saying this, but it's given me joy every time I've walked down it, compared with that muddy mess that was there before. Performance wise, it's bonkers what you can do with this stuff. I've wheeled heavy trolleys with gas pipes down it, wheelbarrows including this one loaded with four sacks of cement, which is heavy. And to show you just how ridiculous it is, I've cycled up and down it in my hybrid mountain bike, which has pretty thin tyres. So I know I said at the start I'd tell you what I've done differently this time around, but to be totally honest with you, I can't actually think of anything I'd improve. And I suppose you could say I've gone back a couple of steps by not putting that weed matting in. The Ansel work gloves I'm using this time around are far superior to what I was wearing a year ago. There's a link to them in the description and when my brand ambassadorship with them runs out shortly, that won't stop me wearing them. Try them yourself and you'll see what I mean. But if you're thinking of installing a path, I hope I've given you a few hints and tips today. Details of everything I've used will, as usual, be in the description below the vid, which you can access on your smartphone or tablet by clicking those show more uh, links in the usual way. Right now you can get a 5% discount on the Needed Gravel by applying the code CHARLIEDIY5 at checkout. So all that remains to me to say is thank you so much for watching today. If you're new to my channel it would mean so much to me to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here and don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all my future uploads. Thanks for watching and I'll hopefully see you in a week's time.